one of my little sticks in the in um, our practice is to find Western thinkers who's um, who I feel has got something to contribute, some sort of complementarity or even supplementarity with the Dharma. I mean, this is a normal part of the Dharma coming into uh, a new developed culture. You can see what happened in China, for instance, that um, something that obviously was a very Indian product was uh, completely reworked in uh, without changing the substance to um, uh, sound familiar to Chinese people and we sort of have to do the same thing uh, when the Dharma comes to the West. So I've um, dealt with a number of these Western thinkers who I think are, are useful to us and um, tonight I want to talk about the new boy on the block, the Swedish um, philosopher Martin Heglund. This is his book and it's called This Life. This, these terms are very important. This Life uh, and the subtitle is Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom. Um, so this book was published last year. It would come out, came out in a paperback uh, this year. It's um, accessibly written. I mean, for those who don't mind reading, you know, abstract ideas. Um, and I just want to explore with you some of the, uh, some of the ideas. I mean, it's a very rich read, um, just extrapolating um, some of the thoughts that he had that I think um, that struck me on first time around as being important for us to think about as uh, Western Dharma practitioners and particularly those of us who regard ourselves as um, uh, secular Buddhists. So what uh, is going on here is um, that he takes us into some areas which I guess a, a lot of um, Buddhists of more conventional type would see as would they, would they would file under let's not go there. So it's going it, it possibly, this is possibly going to be uh, mildly controversial. So Hegelund starts out from this premise. We're all vulnerable and dependent on others all of the time. Our lives will end in death and death is final. Our lives entail finite lifespans and possibilities. And this is why philosophers call this point of view, a very widespread point of view in the West, finitude. We are finite in the sense of being, of having finite lifespan and finite resources and being completely dependent on other people in physical and emotional and other ways. Um, now, some of uh, you might um, question our finitude out of a belief in rebirth or some other post-mortem existence that implies endless life, like going to heaven. If so, uh, you can treat the rest of what I'm going to say as an interesting counterfactual, but still might have implications, might still press some buttons for you in, as you look at your spiritual practice. Those of us who do uh, take on board uh, the idea of finitude, on the other hand, must take this, our one and only life, extremely seriously. And this, of course, explains the book's main title, This Life. Uh, but we may scratch our heads, of course, and wonder about the term of Heglund's subtitle, secular faith. Now, what can that possibly mean? Because most of us, I guess, see, uh, see the word faith as referring to uh, religious faith, uh, faith in, um, in things that we can't verify empirically and so forth. Um, and, this, um, and with religious faith, which is a term he also uses, religious faith um, is usually um, 
faith in something very different to us mere mortals. It can be faith in God or heaven or eternal life uh, or the nirvana idea in conventional Buddhism. In other words, things that are not finite, things that are endless, um, <laughs> things that um, are above the, the trouble and strife of finite lives. So what, what on earth can you mean by secular faith? Can, does, is this just not an oxymoron, uh, a contradiction in terms? Uh, because secular, the, the word secular refers to something that is bound to a limited time and to specific situations that we ourselves find ourselves in, this world, this time. And this comes from a, a, an adjective that, um, in, in Hegel's case, he takes from St. Augustine, where, who uses the term, the, the uh, Latin adjective, secularis, to mean precisely um, what is bounded by time and this worldly existence. Um, and uh, what Hegel is saying here is that Anyone who wants to lead a meaningful life, anyone who wants to take this life seriously, must commit themselves heart and soul to other people, things or projects and ideals uh, that she sets up as central values in her life. So it's the term faith means exactly the same thing here as it would in a religious setting where we're supposed to give ourselves heart and soul to the love of God or to uh, the search for nirvana or whatever it is. So faith, of course, is uh, the word faith is associated with the word fidelity. So we must, uh, we must be uh, exercise fidelity to whatever we identify as our, uh, the object of our ultimate loyalty. And for years and years, I've often um, suggested to people who are practicing the Dharma that they should set aside time to identify what exactly it is that is at the centre of their lives. What is it uh, that to, um, to which they owe their ultimate loyalty? And it's a really interesting question. And as I talk, you might want to think about that. Um, but um, whereas if you've got secular faith, you'll be thinking about things in this life, uh, projects, ideals, missions, uh, relationships, and so on. Um, just as the uh, people who practicing religious faith would be thinking about uh, the hereafter, whatever it contains uh, for them. From this point, Heglund sets up a contrast between two pure models of faith. Religious faith in the, in the eternal and the certain versus secular faith in beings, causes and things which, like us, are always at risk, are always time bound, could always fail. So the model of religious faith implies devaluation of this worldly life. It sees the elements of this life as an inferior fallen state of being, a testing ground or prelude before entering into some promised superior existence and timeless bliss. Timeless bliss. And for the religion, for those who are practicing religious faith, these are the only worthy objects of our ultimate care and loyalty. So we, we've got these two conceptions of faith. Both of them involve the concept of fidelity uh, and energy going into them. Um, and um, these two models often exist in our lives side by side. So we ought to treat them as pure models because we're not talking about, you know, how any particular individual functions or prioritizes things, but as 
um, pure models um, or ideal types, as they say in sociology, uh, they're still quite useful for us to think through. Um, there are blindingly obvious mismatches of these two kinds of faith, you know, the, uh, the hypocrisy of a lot of um, public figures who showily go to church every Sunday and photograph outside a little wooden church, profess their Christian faith and then spend the rest of the week doing horrible things that um, completely uh, go against the Christian ethos. And in the Christian, in the Buddhist world, of course, we have um, we have um, elites who profess their uh, Buddhist um, fidelity in exactly the same way, and then spend their time um, involved in genocide and other human rights abuses. So there's that kind of hypocrisy. But what is more important in this problem of mixing and matching? Uh, more honest people um, who had thought, who think of themselves as being uh, absolutely committed to their religious faith. But when it comes to the crunch, as it does inevitably for us all, they can't, they can't sustain it. And Heglund uh, takes, spends a good deal of time discussing three cases of this. Um, three very prominent uh, Christian writers and thinkers, St. Augustine, Martin Luther, and C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis being the modern example, uh, the, um, the wonderful writer who took us to Narnia and other wonderful places. Now, each, of, and he, of course, C.S. Lewis was a very serious um, writer in theology, uh, a, a, quite a significant um, uh, contributed to the Christian tradition. Now, each of these three people suffered an overpowering bereavement on the death of someone close to them. Uh, in Augustine's case, it was a close friend. In Martin Luther's case, it was his daughter, Magdalena. Um, and in C.S. Lewis's case, it was his wife. And all three of them wrote eloquent conf confessions or memoirs, I guess we would more likely call them, about the agonies they went through uh, when, as they were grieving these loved ones. Um, they wrote about their inconsolable agony, compounded by the fact that their grief seemed to them to constitute a form of infidelity to, uh, to their Christian commitment. Uh, they were supposed to be committed to God and eternal truths, but here they were completely unhinged by uh, secular losses, uh, losses in, uh, in the world. Um, and so th this created an enormous amount of, apart from the grief itself, it created an enormous amount of angst for them over the fact that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't stick to their principles that only God, only the hereafter mattered. Um, so um, what they discovered was that what we really care about are things like us, things that are all beings, people, causes that are like us. They're at risk. They're at stake. And for that reason, they are terribly important to us. Um, and when we feel a deep grief like this, it is a way of honouring uh, our fidelity to th people and things like us. Um, and it really shows us where our true allegiance lies. Um, now, in uh, most religions, there's a, uh, a kind of analgesic for... Uh, for these kinds of for this kind of suffering, you know, if you uh, read um, the death notices in the in the Herald or whatever newspaper you you read, uh, you will find that no one has really died. They have passed on. 
uh, to a new life in a better place. Uh, in the words of my favourite um, prayer book, ensure and certain hope in the resurrection. My favourite prayer book being, of course, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. Now Mary is reunited with Fred, her beloved predeceased husband. Uh, the death notices in the newspaper inform us. So um, that's one way of um, finding consolation for, um, <coughs> for death. But the ultimate religious balm to solve, to, to solve our losses fo follows the ancient Stoics and, for that matter, the Buddhist monastics in counselling detachment from the concerns of this world. This is, of course, what Augustine and Luther and C.S. Lewis found themselves unable to do. But anyway, this is the advice to be, to practice detachment. If we're not attached to anyone or anything, if we don't care about them, then we can't be hurt when she, he or it suffers or ceases to exist. The Stoics, um, the ancient Greek Stoics, called this happy condition apatheia, uh, hence our modern word apathy. In conventional Buddhism, it's called liberation. Um, but as Chris Christopherson, one of our favourite um, uh, blues and western singers, summed up in his deathless um, blues number, Me and Bobby McGee, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing ain't worth nothing, but it's free. So Hedlund offers a more inspiring concept of freedom than that. Whereas the object of religious faith is salvation, the object of, so the, the object of religious faith is salvation, the object of secular faith is spiritual freedom. Secular faith has no use for salvation, but values above all the spiritual freedom that in Hegelund's words, requires the ability to ask which imperatives to follow in light of our ends, as well as the ability to call into question, challenge and transform our ends themselves. So in his words, salvation promises freedom from finite life, secular practice seeks the liberation of finite life. So um, every, um, as most people will know, every freedom um, implies a corresponding responsibility. Like Socrates before him, Hegelund sees the good life, the ethical, ethical good life, as consisting of constantly reposing afresh. The ethical question, what comprises the good life for me in my situation? for a person like me. In asking that question, we must remain conscious of our working towards the horizon of our own certain death at an uncertain point in time. We must work with our irreducible anxiety. And there's an interesting riff on anxiety. We carry a tremendous responsibility being sick, being um, spiritually free um, and we shouldn't dismiss that anxiety uh, as some sort of um, psychological condition or psychological malfunction. Uh, it's inherent in the freedom that we uh, that we can take up if we so choose. Um, and um, because we must be constantly asking ourselves if we are living this one life meaningfully and intelligibly. We must enter as deeply as possible into our everyday experience and our memory of past experience in order to get a handle on how our life is developing, the trajectory we're following. So what is a Dharma practitioner to make of these ideas? 
Uh, on important points, Hegelin's perspective converges with the Dharma's. He's talking about impermanence, the uncertainty implied by dependent arising, conscious life understood as an ethical path to be lived mindfully and responsibly, as one emphasising compassion, generosity and wisdom. He is, uh, he is reproducing an ethic of care, just as the Buddha did uh, when he talked about care being like the elephant's footprint, which can contain the footprint of all the other animals on earth. In other words, all, uh, all the virtues that the Dharma recommends that we practice can all fit into uh, this omnibus ethic of care. Uh, but Hegelin brackets conventional Buddhism with Christianity and nails both for offering salvation in the form of blissful eternal life, uh, which he says um, somewhat uh, controversially is really tantamount to death for people like us. You know, we live through our relationships, we live through our projects, um, and uh, we live through the events that are constantly occurring uh, in our lives. What on earth would it mean to be suddenly in a plane of existence where nothing ever happens, um, where everything is already perfect, nothing ever breaks down, nothing ever ends? What sort of life is that for beings like us? Um, and... Um, and so what uh, he is saying about conventional Buddhism and Christianity is that they are devaluing this life for disparaging the attachments that make this life so significant and challenging, for setting up a life-impoverishing ideal of renunciation and precluding the fundamental questions that go to the heart of spiritual freedom. On the other hand, Hegelin's work implicitly sharpens the profile of secular Dharma practice. It emphasises the importance of asking and reposing the big hard questions about what makes for a flourishing life, free of metaphysical certitudes that foreclose all those questions. In the Satipatthana Sutta and elsewhere, the Buddha encourages us to see for ourselves the transitory, precarious, shifting ground on which we stand and he invites us to treat it as our spiritual home base. Coming to see life in this way constitutes the thrust of insight meditation. The Buddha doesn't encourage us to then disparage and renounce our worldly commitments as, uh, as I think certain religious versions of Buddhism do. Rather, he leaves the door open to our enriching this life with insight and understanding, as Hegelund would have us do. Now, a central issue here is the treatment of dukkha, um, the Pali word in the early teachings for suffering, anguish, stress, and various other um, synonyms that are found for it. Conventional Buddhism shrinks the Dharma down to a flight from all suffering as such. And that seems to me to be uh, actually a, a deviation from the early teachings where uh, suffering is actually divided between the suffering that is impossible to avoid for a human being. The suffering that's enumerated in the first discourse being um, birth, death, aging, sickness, being separated from what we love, being thrown together with what we detest, frustration, our psychophysical, our whole psycho, psychophysical vulnerability. These are things that no one who reaches mature ages can avoid, no matter what they do. Um, there's that other suffering caused by uh, our instinctual response 
to the difficulties of life, which are greed, hatred, and con greed, hatred, and confusion or delusion, whatever you like to call it. That is the kind of suffering we can uh, we can ultimately get beyond by dealing with those instinctual reactions. Uh, and to that extent, of course, the Dharma is a strategy for avoiding that kind of suffering, but it's not a strategy for avoiding suffering as a whole. And yet this is what um, conventional Buddhism is actually doing, is conflating these two and saying, look, we've got a panacea for the whole lot. Um, so um, it seems to me that um, uh, in doing that, conventional Buddhism is turning the, the, the whole tradition into a flight from suffering. And we have to ask, okay, you know, suffering can be pretty awful, but is it really big enough? Does it have the dignity to constitute uh, what meaning means to us in, in our lives? Is this what our life is about, is avoiding suffering? Isn't there, aren't there other things that are bigger that we really want to uh, that we really want to commit ourselves to in this life. Um, so um, that is, I think, one of the final big questions that Hegelund is, uh, is proposing for us. And of course, we find in the Dharma that there are things that are uh, much more important. The development uh, of virtues, the pursuit uh, of experienced truth, and so on. Um, so um, we, can, we can read a whole other story out of the early teachings and out of subsequent contributions that tell us that the, the Dharma is not just about a flight from suffering, but is actually about embracing uh, values and virtues that we can develop in this life. Uh, and if we embrace that sort of mission, then we can all flourish together. So I'll just end up uh, with uh, three lines from uh, our favourite Buddhist poet, Mary Oliver, in her poem, The Summer Day. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? <laughs>